This week, my guest is Chris Ledoux, C-H-R-I-S, capital L-E, capital D-O-U-X. Everybody know how to spell your name, Chris? Uh, well, no, not really. <laughs> I suppose if somebody who doesn't know you writes your name down, it could come out anyway uh, when you get to the, the Ledoux part. Yeah, we've had it pronounced a lot of different ways. Lodox, Deluxe, they get the, get the L and the D turned around. Oh, I like yeah. that. Chris Deluxe. Yeah. That's good. <laughs> French? Yeah. Yeah, the name's French. Dad was raised in upstate New York, and uh, I'm sure the French-Canadian influence was there. Well, I started to go the <laughs> other way. I, I wondered if you were Cajun. Uh, well, I think his uh, ancestors missed the boat to Louisiana when they all took off from uh, the French-Canadian part and headed down looking for Acadia. So I'm sure I've got relatives down there. I've met a lot of Ledoux in Louisiana. Can you spoke it? Can I spoke? <laughs> well, we lived in France when I was a kid on an Air Force base. Oh, really? So we had to take some French classes. And I can just remember a few words, uh, like water is O, uh, an egg is an oof. Uh, I can count to ten and uh, say parlez-vous Francais, but I can't, I can't parley it. Did you live all over the world? Uh, well, all over the United States. Uh, I was born in Mississippi. We moved to Long Island, New York. I uh, went to France for three years, back to Pennsylvania, back to Mississippi, then to Texas, and then to Wyoming. All these Air Force bases? Uh, most of them, yeah. Name some of them. Well, I can remember that uh, there was a Keesler. At, at Biloxi? Probably. Shoot, was there a Travis? Or, uh, Travis in California. Oh, no, it weren't in Travis. Bergstrom. Is that the one in Austin? I think so. Mm. Well, uh, obviously, uh, your dad spent most of his life in the Air Force. Yeah, he flew uh, B-17 bombers in World War II and flew in Korea. Uh, yeah, and he, I guess they grounded him finally, wanted to put him behind a desk, and he said, well, if you ground me, I'm going to retire. So he retired in Austin. Chris, how did you get your first notoriety? Uh, well, rodeo. I okay. mean, well, football in high school, I suppose, too. Was Garth Brooks the reason that Chris Ledoux has a music career? Uh, well, no, but he was a big help in taking it to the next level. Uh, we'd been making records for uh, probably 18 years up until the time Garth mentioned my name in that song and had a, a big following out west. And I maybe I didn't realize how big a following I had until that song came along. Garth even told me, he says, man, using your name in that song has helped my career tremendously. And I thought he was kidding, but uh, I guess there were a lot of fans out there. Uh, you look at the album sales that we had through our own small record label, uh, and as hard to get as those tapes were, probably for every tape sold, there were 20 copies made because people couldn't find find them. So, you know, that, that'd be a lot of numbers out there. Well, what was the song? Much Too Young. What was the line? Was uh, it Much Too Young to uh, Feel This Damn feel Old? This damn old? Uh -huh. what, was the, what was the line about you? A uh, worn out tape of Chris Ledoux. A worn out tape by Chris Ledoux. Uh -huh. Was was Garth Brooks a fan of yours? Uh, I guess so. I, a guy named Randy Taylor, who Garth had gone to college with, uh, introduced Garth to the music. Uh, Randy had been a fan, I guess, for a long time. And they have sat down and co-wrote uh, Much Too Young. Are you recording for Garth's label? Uh, uh, yeah, Capital Liberty. Liberty? Uh -huh. Is that a coincidence? I don't know. I really don't. Uh, I never did ask Garth if he had any uh, input to sign me or what. Uh, the things I heard was Western merchandisers were selling a lot of our product on the independent label. And uh, a guy named Bill Kennedy out in L.A. who works with Liberty uh, kept trying to convince them to sign me. And eventually, you know, got Bowen to come out and check us out. Did he watch you perform? Uh, Bowen, Yeah. Uh, he came to a show we were doing with Garth. We opened for him in Oklahoma, and he flew his Learjet out <laughs> and watched the show. And uh, I guess it was, uh, well, for two reasons. One, to see if, if, that's, if it would work, and the other reason was to see if, if my band would uh, work well enough to use them in the studio, which he said, yeah, that's fine. We'll go ahead and, and try it. Did you make your own records for years? Did you uh, pay for the recording yourself? Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, the folks. My folks helped, you know, and the first album we did was in a guy's basement in Sheridan, Wyoming. I had a highway patrolman playing bass <laughs> and a rancher playing lead, and I played uh, rhythm and sang. 
and sent the master tape to my folks who by that, that time had moved to Mount Juliet and asked them if they could reproduce them. And uh, then Dad started the company and then eventually started coming to Nashville and making records. So it, it kind of varied from year to year on how many albums were sold, uh, what kind of a budget we would have for the next project. And usually the budget was fairly limited, and uh, we'd go in and whip out an album. How did you sell the records? Did you sell them at your concerts? Uh, well, I wasn't doing concerts then. I was just rodeoing. Uh, did you sell them at rodeos? Uh, yeah, my brother would come on the road, and he'd set up... Uh, a booth at uh, some of the bigger rodeos and sell them. My folks were selling them through Mail Order, Western Horseman, uh, Rodeo Sports News, and I always had a box of them under the bed of my truck. And if someone wanted one, I'd dig one out and sell them, but uh, I felt too self-conscious to actually get out and hawk them. Did you do songs that were other people's hits? Uh, well, early on, everything I did were, was, uh, were things that I'd written myself. And uh, then Dad said, well, we got to have an album every year, so some years I just wouldn't have time or the inspiration to, to write everything, so we'd have to use outside material. Chris, I guess you are noted for singing cowboy songs more than anything else. Mm -hmm. And uh, those early albums that you earlier told me about, were they albums that featured basically cowboy music? Uh, pretty much, yeah. You, you take maybe the first five or six albums we did were uh, pretty strictly songs about... Uh, either the rodeo lifestyle or ranching or, or something. Did you ever do Willie Nelson music? Uh, yeah, we did. Uh, Ed Bruce? Yeah, Mamas Don't Let Your Babies Grow Up to Cowboys. I had to do that. Uh, Red-Headed Stranger. Yeah, there were uh, quite a few of those songs that uh, were just too good to pass up. Are you the Western in country and Western? A little, I guess, yeah. <laughs> because basically uh, people that say country and Western are not real big fans. Mm -hmm. Because we, it's called the Country Music Association, not yeah. the Country and Western Music Association. Yeah. Basically, we call it all country, and yet we have a great Western heritage, mm -hmm. which you and Michael Martin Murphy seem to be uh, continuing with. Yeah, yeah, Michael's doing a great job. He's uh, picking up pretty much on the real old traditional things that I was doing uh, early in my career, which, to this point, the music has evolved into something a little more, uh, what, what do you call it, contemporary. Do you ever uh, play those uh, <clears throat> those West Fest? I uh, did a couple of them. You know Waddy Mitchell? Yeah. The the cowboy poet? Mm -hmm. He's great. Yeah, Baxter Black, all those guys, yeah. They impress me as being, I think they're, they're real cowboys, first of all. Right. They really know what they're talking about. Uh-huh, yeah. Just like the Wrangler commercial, you know, those guys out there have a lot of time to think, <laughs> a lot of time to write. So the, the poetry that they come up with uh, is pretty deep sometimes. Are you a songwriter? Uh, yes. Have you, do you write for other people? No. no I just, uh, whenever I write something, it's, it's either something I have to get off my chest or a message I want to get out there or a story that I want to want to put down. I never write anything with anybody else in mind. It's you know, just so a, you never pitch your songs to Garth or anybody else? No, huh? He might try it. He, might, he might like them. Well, I'd be honored if uh, someone would cut one, yeah. Chris, tell me about your years as a rodeo performer. Were you a national champion? Uh, yeah, in 76, I won the world's championship in the bareback riding. Uh, went through a lot of injuries to get there. What were you, what were you riding bareback? Uh, horses, ho horses or bulls? Yeah, bucking horses. Is that where you have to stay on for eight seconds? Uh, yeah, it's an eight-second ride. Uh, it's a scored event. Uh, well, kind of like diving or something where it's, uh, it's a lot of form involved and how good the horse bucks. Uh, yeah, it's a, it's a gut-level lifestyle. You know, you're, you're living with the dirt and the flies and, and the open sky and the open road, and it's great. I wouldn't have traded it for anything. I guess a mouthful of dirt uh, would not be uh, difficult to, to get when they throw you off that horse. No, you, yeah, or something a little greener. <laughs> <laughs> well, and then, uh, well, oh, you said something that made me curious. If the bucking horse is not hot enough, doesn't buck enough, do they do they uh, score you lower? Uh huh. Yeah, you're you're marked on uh, how well you ride, and then the horse is marked on how well he bucks. Well, who picks out the horse? <clears throat> uh, well, they, they use a computer to draw them. Uh, used to be they uh, put the horse's number in a hat numbers and draw them out for each cowboy but now they have a computer system that uh, 
randomly draws. All right, when you won the world's championship, what did you have to do to, to win the world's championship? Uh, win the most money at the national finals in Oklahoma City. All right, how many horses did you have to ride successfully to do that? Uh, well, it was 10 in 10 days, but I had three re-rides, so I wound up getting on 13. How do you get a re-ride? What, uh, what if your horse doesn't buck? Well enough, uh, had one run off, and then another one didn't uh, didn't perform like he should. Uh, Who makes that call? The judges? Yeah, yeah. Just talking about it, it would seem like eight seconds. That's such a short time that you could stay on a horse that long. But I've I've seen these things happen, mm -hmm. and guys get thrown off immediately at times. Yeah, yeah. They just ride out of the shooting, and suddenly they're in the, on the ground. Yeah, eight seconds. It uh, it can be a long time. Sometimes I mean, it's not long enough if you have a real nice one. <laughs> you wish it could go on forever. Do you get too old to rodeo? Oh, yeah. Like you get too old to play baseball and football and whatever. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's mainly mental. If you still have the drive and desire and the want to, uh, you can continue on because uh, they make lots of tape where you can tape your parts together that don't work very good anymore. <laughs> like Freckles Brown, uh, he rode till he was in his 50s and was still winning. Oh, man, there's, they have some old-timers rodeos now for guys that are over 40. Uh, shoot, they're still riding at 50, 55. But I had enough, you know, at, uh, I can't remember. I was Did 32. You get had a horse fall with me at the Astrodome in Houston, wrecked my knee, pulled my collarbone out at Phoenix, tailbone, milk cow, Cody, Wyoming, broke it. <laughs> uh, to sternum, I had a horse throw me off and step on my back in Lehigh, Utah. Uh, yeah, you pick up injuries. So you've had a lot of injuries. A few, yeah. yeah. Is that why you quit? Well, partially, I think. And then uh, just uh, other things become more important, like family and, and uh, realizing that uh, your number's bound to come up someday. The odds are getting, getting greater and greater the older you get. <laughs> I think you might want to go back on that senior rodeo. Series. No, no. <laughs> no way. Chris, tell me about the making of the record with Garth Brooks. What you going to do with a cowboy? Uh, we were in the office down at Liberty one day, and uh, this song came in from Garth's publishing company. And uh, I happened to talk to Garth that next day on the phone for some reason, and he asked me if I'd received the song. And if I wanted to record it, he wanted to rewrite a line or two. And uh, then the label got involved and said, why don't you guys do a duet? So we talked it over <laughs> and, uh, and decided to go ahead. And there's very few guys that I would feel comfortable doing a duet with, and, and he's definitely one of them. And, uh, yeah, it's a great song. Uh, one thing about it, uh, uh, Garth even told me, he said, the reason he couldn't cut it himself, he wrote it or co-wrote it, uh, says, well, he says, man, I'm not a real cowboy. You know, I couldn't really pull this off, but you are. Uh, and the song is about cowboys. Uh, it's kind of a warning to ladies that have never been around us what they might expect. And on the other hand, in the second verse, it's a tribute to the women that have put up with us for years. Are you still a cowboy? Oh, yeah. You have a ranch? Mm-hmm. Where do you live? Wyoming. What do you do on your ranch? Uh, well, nothing right now. I'm on the bus all the time. But uh, uh, we have cows. We had sheep for years. I finally realized that uh, they weren't going to work. Uh, but we finally have cows. Things look good. Uh, thanks to the music the place, the place is paid for. So the dark clouds have rolled away, and it's wonderful. Chris, thank you. Thanks a lot, Ralph. My pleasure.